Thank you very much, Adrian. So we heard in yesterday's policy panel that actually we do need to reach out more to broader groups in society and do so in novel and innovative ways to regain trust. And I think that's agreed amongst all. However, when we turn from the theory to the practice, that's where we see the challenges. We actually run up against quite a few constraints, sometimes due to our mandate. Where can we communicate? Which are the themes and topics we can communicate on? The legal frameworks we have? And some rules also which are self-imposed, such as the quiet period. And believe me, a quiet period that lasts a week, the world doesn't stand still for a week. And in terms of a fast-moving world, a lot, of, um, a lot of challenges can come up in terms of communications. So I'm going to use the next 10 minutes to really tackle three issues. First, to reach out, we need to know our audiences. So who are our, our, our audiences and what do we know about them in the euro area? Second, how can we reach out effectively and how do we define success? And third, what are the technological challenges that we're facing? So first, who is it that we want to get through to? Here in the European Union and in the Eurozone more specifically, we know from surveys like the Eurobarometer that the level of awareness regarding the ECB is quite high. Actually, nine out of 10 Europeans have heard about us. Not many people or institutions can say that about themselves. What is interesting, and this is also linking to the Mentimeter, is that still the vast majority of people, around 93%, have actually heard about the ECB on traditional media. So if we go through this, it is TV, 85%, 62% newspapers, the print version, 49% radio, and only a minority at the moment, on, and although that's increasing on internet, Facebook, and the ECB website. So right there, you'll see a challenge um, that I'll come to in terms of TV. It is not our own voice on TV, it's reporting. And it is not in our language necessarily, because the, the most used language is English, but there is a translation filter. And we've seen it that when you have a board member speaking and actually the, the language is a different one, sometimes actually it's a, you know, it is a male voice and a, and, and a female speak over, it does lead to some, you know, some, some strange feelings. The challenge we have at the same time and although people hear about us through various channel, uh, channels, is that only 47%, and that's less than half, say that they understand what the ECB does. And even lower, and that's the real worry, is the trust in the ECB at 37%. And a lot has been written about that. And my main point here is actually a paradox, is that while the euro is widely popular, 73%, it's never been as popular, the very institution, that is behind the euro, ensuring its value, ensuring its stability, that's the one that's suffering from trust, even if we already saw an, an uptake in the last quarter. So that really calls for a bit of analysis. You know, what drive those num what's driving those numbers and what's actually influencing people's, uh, people's trust behavior and, and people's lack of trust. One of the things that's interesting, and we've seen that in research by Michael Ehrman, who was on the, po on the podium yesterday, is when the economy is slumping and people's personal situation deteriorates, that's when trust goes down. So one could say, well, then there's not much that we can do about it. Um, but actually, that's not true. And we also know that just relying on the recovery for trust to return is not enough. So the question is, why are those people not trusting the ECB? And what can we do about it? There's a quite intuitive, uh, there's evidence supporting quite an intuitive line, which is helping us in terms of communication. Those who know more about the ECB also have a better understanding about what we do, and then there are those who trust us more. And the majority of people who trust the ECB, indeed, if we look at the figures, consider themselves to have some or good knowledge of the ECB. That's 54%. And of, on average, those people are the ones who have a higher level of education. So this is actually the crowd that we're most communicating to, and this is when we're in our comfort zone. Therefore, it also means that if we want to move the needle here, what we have to do is reach out precisely to these other groups, those who are less interested, and those who will speak a different language, and those who are not typically addressing, i.e. we're going to the beyond the comfort zone. But my main conclusion here is we need to make the ECB understood, not liked, understood. And this is what we show here. That's quite difficult, um, per se, and in general, but we have to do this at across 19 countries and up to 24 different languages. We not only have the linguistic barrier, um, Silvio de Goulart also mentioned yesterday 
people in different countries may have very different challenges. Why some may be worried about interest rates and savings, some actually worry about making the ends meet at the end of the month. Some are thinking about career, some are thinking of getting out of unemployment. So that will also um, have an implication on the topics that they're interested in. And that leads me to my second point. How do we go about understanding the needs and listening in order to make the ECB understood? So what most people don't know is that we have a lot, and a lot of data coming in based on public inquiries. Thousands a month of telephone calls, of letters, of emails, which don't come from media, which also give us a good insight as to what people in the European Union are actually worried about. To address this, however, we've also felt that there is nothing better and more um, effective than, directive, than direct interaction. So on the one hand, we will try to do face-to-face -face direct interaction. That's one of the, the, the part of our two-pillar approach. And on the other hand, it's stepping up our digital engagement. On the direct interaction, let me tell you, it's a bit of a challenge because we have 340 million Europeans. So if the ECB is trying to interact directly with 340 million Europeans, it's going to keep us all very busy. But thank God we have the Euro system. And this is where the, the system has been very efficient um, at reaching out in their own countries in their own language, understanding the themes, and specifically also focusing on financial education. So some central banks, for instance, the uh, Central Bank of Spain does a lot with schools. The, France has a fantastic, the French have a fantastic website also in explaining economic concepts. Everyone's found a way supporting that need for financial education. Here at the ECB, we've just opened the visitor center last month. Some of you walked, well, you all walked past it on, on the way to the conference room. Some of you have registered. Uh, for a guided tour at the end of the conference. And the aim of this is to increase people coming to the ECB and understanding the concepts. And that's probably going to drive the numbers up from 15,000 to 40,000, which, to be honest, you know, in the light of the millions we just mentioned, is not much. And the other point is the people who actually ask to visit the ECB, they're the ones who have convinced. They're the ones who are already interested. The challenge is how will we reach the ones who are not interested? And this is where, if we look at a challenge all institutions, the media, but also in the institutions face, is trust. So why would people actually want to find out about an institution they don't really know about and fundamentally they don't trust anyway? Especially when you actually also know, um, according to various surveys, that people don't trust the heads of institutions, they trust people like you and me. Um, that's family, that's friends, that's neighbors, they are the real trustful sources of information. And this is where the ECB has started tapping a so far vastly unused resource, our own employees. Because they are the ones, like you and me, they are the ones who go out, they are the ones who have the social events. But what you actually then need to do for that is equip with the necessary tools. So one of the elements we've done is, after each press conference, after big, each big inter international events, is explain what the policies of the ECB are, why, and give some easy to use and literally that you can use for the soft, for the, for the small talk lines for, for all our employees. Now, this is also not without risk. We talked about noise, we talked about uh, different uh, messages. And even if you go to school, um, even if you go to a so called you know, private event trying to educate, there will be social media coverage. So we're exposing ourselves to risk in terms of explanations being misinterpreted in terms of any different word being seen as a, um, as a different stance from the, from the ECB. But actually, in terms of communication, I'm convinced that that's the right way to go. We have motivated employees, and we should take that risk and just give everyone the education that they need. Another way of getting people interested is just showing us in different angles. So one of the things that we've done when we had two years ago the big migrant wave, some staff of the ECB went out to help young migrants, 14, 16, 18-year-olds coming from Africa from, from, from really tough places, and helped them integrate in Frankfurt. And some of them spent quite a bit of their free time on weekends teaching them languages. Now, they weren't interested in the ECB. They were interested in surviving and you know, getting used to, to Europe. But our hope is that with that, we will have the chance of getting them, once they are set in, to say, well, why don't, I, why don't I actually try and find out a little bit more about this institution? The same is ar architectures. 
we have a great building, you can get people in here doing an architecture tour. Again, that's a different way. Um, that's potentially a more emotional way, and emotional normally doesn't sit well with, uh, with central banks. I'm not going to dwell too much looking at the time on, on, on language, um, and Andy Haldane already referred to this in, in, in a former speech, you may speak about it today, but I would just say that if we only went back to George Orwell's politics and the English language from back in 1946, we would already make um, a big change. One of the things, for instance, he recommends is never to use a long word where a short one will do, and never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. And that, I think, is key, because jargon, by definition, creates distance. It creates the higher level and the below, and it basically shows that you know them versus us, the elite versus the rest. And if we could just start by that internally and then use it externally, it would help. Now I'm going to definitely wake you up. Um, there is a bit of economics are boring, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. You can actually now let me see if this works. You can actually make economics very entertaining. Going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle, and good reason to fear it. Play low well interest no. rates. It's the animal spirit. Fear the boom and bust. Um, Keynes versus Hag debate. It actually goes on for minutes. It's been viewed six million times. This is a very different way of communicating. And I'm not saying, let me reassure you, the ECB will go down this route. But what we, what we have realized, though, is that we do need to use much more animation, much more video. And one of the things that worked best for the ECB is when we went down our asset purchase program, we did a video for internal purposes, using our own employees to explain what we're doing. And then the media team said, well, actually, why don't we use this externally? And it's the one that's worked best. So it's going away from text. It's going a little bit more into emotions, showing people. We didn't, you know, we used our own staff who work every day. And that was the one that worked best. Um, now online, the second prong. Um, we've just seen, for instance, Facebook, um, as one of the words mentioned. One of the things is we're reaching out, but we also need, we're also looking exactly at what platform, for which purpose, for which audience. So Twitter, yes, we are on Twitter, but that's an expert audience again. Um, should we be on Instagram? That's a question. What is, what is the message? What is the audience? Um, LinkedIn, for instance, is another great tool. Again, that's not the same as Facebook. That might be more to show the experience we have to get people for HR, to get people recruited. So we're doing a lot of work there. Um, but I also think that very often people just rage in, and one of the in my view, one of the um, opportunities we don't have is the trial and error. We mentioned it yesterday, if you start something, you can't stop it. And if it fails, certainly for the ECB, it's going to fail very visibly. That's in a world where, however, technology is a big challenge because we have the rise of machines. And it was mentioned yesterday, how many of the people reading our Twitter are actually machines? We don't know. Um, how, many, how many of the people criticizing us are machines? We don't know. But what is really scary is to get this machinery for or against you is actually very cheap to buy. You can influence social media very easily. So a research firm just recently reported that for as little as $2.60, and that's less than a Starbucks coffee, you can buy 100 comments on a YouTube video. For $800, you can get a fake press release. And just imagine the impact of a fake you know, introductory statement released on the ECB. So I think we also, and we'll probably be discussing this on the panel, this is what we, what we need to think about. And therefore, my final reflection is really, we need to, all the communicators in the central banking world, like everyone else, we need to reflect about the evolution of big data, data analytics, the micro-targeting for ourselves, how we use the algorithms. If others use bots, why wouldn't you? We use bots to reply. Um, and certainly, how can we make sure that we always know who we're talking to and what the best mechanism is to deal with this? I think there's a lot more to discuss on this. We'll have the panel and potentially also another conference on the subject. Thank you very much.